but a parabola has only one. It's very important, because we'll see this throughout the Gospels. In any case, the telos, the telos of, a go of the Gospel, and this is, we're talking about Matthew, so what is the telos? Based on history, you know, we proved his historically, we could just conclude that just like Herodotus or Theodocles or whatever, that maybe Matthew is just a historical document, right? Just a recounting historical. Logos to tell us stop, still a recounting historical. Because we know, but that, that won't work for us. Why won't it work? Why will that not work? Why can't we just accept Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as simply a historical Herodotus or Theodocles? Because Theodocles and Herodotus, Theodocles and Herodotus do not have any sayings in their documents. Their documents are narratives. Right? What we have is we have in all the Gospels, mm -hmm. just like in Greek dialogues, a dialogue component and a narrative component. And the dialogue component is put into context by the narrative component. So, we know that the Greek literature dialogues are not based in that model. That is a his purely historical narrative model. The narratives are closer, but the Greek histories use that organization. We know that literature in other cultures are organized differently than English. We know the Gospels are not organized in this, the way we would expect them to be written in English, right? Anyone who's read them. The, are the Gospels organized the way we'd organize something in English literature? I don't care how hard you try to put them into that framework, it won't work, no. because they're not. So therefore, we have to look at how is Matthew organized. And the best way to do that, what should we look at? If we're going to look for a Logos to Telos in Matthew, what should we look for? Dialogue. And what you find in Matthew, and you've probably heard this before, this isn't new stuff, right? That Matthew is organized around five great discourses. Have you heard that? You've never heard that? No. Tell your pastors to get on the ball. Because any commentary on Matthew, any commentary will tell you that Matthew is organized around five great discourses. The five great discourses is what we'll talk about. And so therefore, these are dialogues, Greek dialogues, right? So if I were looking for the Logos to tell us in one of the Gospels, especially Matthew, where would I look? In the dialogues, in the discourses. You know, Matthew's organized into five of them. Isn't that cool? This should be pretty easy, right? It is. It's amazingly easy. The focus of Matthew is on these discourses. So, if we study the focus of the discourses, then on the narrative framework. We don't have time to do that. I, you know, I actually did a class. I just finished, well, I haven't finished. I've still got some more classes to go. But I've taken two semesters to do uh, a whole class of Matthew, looking at it from the framework of the discourse and the narrative. It's a very complex class. Um, very difficult class because it is, because um, I'm going actually into the Greek, into, deep into the Greek on that. But in any case, we don't have time to do that in this class, so what we have to do is we have to look at the discourses, look at them specifically, and see how they fo focus, and then see how it focuses within the parallels to Hebrew literature and culture. That's what kind of we've been doing already, but let's see how it works. So let's talk a little about Matthew. Who is this Matthew guy? He's Jewish. He's a tax collector. He's literate but to what degree? Remember how we talked about how they worked, how, how, Literate stuff worked in those days. So, you know, it is even possible you couldn't read and write. However, he was a he was he was a tax collector, right? A collector of the toll, literally a collector of the tribute to Caesar. And so, this guy, what do you think? Think he's literate? He better be. <laughs> better be, because remember, in literary in the ancient world, you learn to read first, and then you learn learn numbers because 
the numbers usually took place from the consonant structure. Remember Hebrew? In Hebrew, the consonants provide the numbers. In almost every language, the numbers are in some way related to the consonants. For example, uh, Roman. You're not counting Roman numerals, right? <laughs> I, 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 right? <laughs> in case. So those are based in consonant structure, right? And so that's what we find. So what do you have to do first before you learn numbers in most cultures in the ancient world? You have to learn to read. You have to be literate. So we can probably guess he's literate. He's got to be a Greek speaker. Has to be a Greek speaker. Was he pharisaically trained? Most likely pharisaically trained. Don't know. Um, numbers, yes. Writing likely. Potentially could write himself. But they didn't have to. Because in the ancient world, what you did is you called that guy up with had all the materials he did. That was your scribe. In any case, let's look at the first dialogue. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. And then he began to teach them, saying, and these are the first words from the Sermon on the Mount. So if you go to Matthew 5, the first discourse is the Sermon on the Mount. What does the Sermon on the Mount tell us? Here is the thesis of Matthew. Actually, um, this is the thesis of Matthew, but there's an even better one that I've been looking at in, my, in the other class, which is the thesis that starts with John the Baptist. What was John the Baptist's message? Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is approaching. Aegeus. And actually, what was Jesus' method or message from that point on? The kingdom is here. No, his message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is Aegeus, is approaching. The same message as John the Baptist. So, although I will tell you that this is this is the thesis of Matthew. The primary thesis of Matthew is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is approaching. So we'll see that in a moment, but in any case, because that's repeated over and over again in the gospel. But this is good enough because this is right at the beginning. Don't think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And literally, I tell you the truth, because I did not parse the Greek for you. I parsed the Greek many times for other classes. But literally this says, the smallest letter, not a jot or a tittle, literally meaning not the smallest letter in the Hebrew which is interesting. And it, it literally says in the Greek, iota, and then, or a tittle, and a tittle is basically an ornamental mark placed in Hebrew literature. And it means specifically the law. And it doesn't mean until everything is accomplished. It literally says, until heaven and earth become one. So what's the message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is approaching. So, until heaven and earth become one, not the smallest letter, the, the law will not pass. So, in any case, and anyone who breaks the least of the commandments and teaches the same. So, Matthew, the focus of Matthew is in what? The law. The law. And Jesus ad, calls himself the representative of the law. There's more to this than that, but, you know, this is the basis of the first dialogue. And this is the thesis, base of the first dialogue, and generally of Matthew. In any case, um, at the end it says this, The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Um, anyone who hears these words of mine does not put them into practice, like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams. Now I'm going to give you a so uh, side of this. And look what it says. When Jesus had finished Logos, what is that? When you finish doing what? Summarizing. Making his argument. No, not summarizing. When he had finished making his argument, they were made. They were made. Now, I want to mention this to you because I want to show you how concrete Greek is. What's the house on the rock? Temple? The temple, yes. Matter of fact, hmm. what's on the place where the temple was today? The mosque. The mosque of the rock. Because the temple was called the house on the rock. Look what it says. Blessed is the man who built his house upon the rock. That's the verse before this. What is he alluding to? Jews. 
the law. Right? The house upon the rock represents the entire the Mosaic Code, right? So a, remember, he begins with the law, and he ends with the law. Hmm. And look at this. I love this. Just a side, this side of the, the concrete side of this. So who built his house on the sand? And actually, it's not sand. It's on the loose, literally on the coast, on the beach. Who built his house on the beach? You have two choices. Both are correct. Where did Caesar, where did Pontius Pilate live during this time? Where did the, where did the Caesarea, no. Caesarea Maritima? Caesarea Mar Maritima is where? On the, coast. On the beach. Where did that fox Herod live? No. no, he did not live in Jerusalem. He lived in Tiberius. Tiberius is built where? On the Sea of Galilee. On the Sea of Galilee. On the beach. Do you see this? Who's Jesus talking about? Oh, that's sneaky. Who's the foolish man who built his house upon the sand? Do you see this? Jesus' words in the Gospel of Matthew are peppered with paradoxical, ironic, and sneaky statements like this throughout the whole thing. The guy was a genius. Oh, duh, right? Okay. This guy is making a political comment in the Sermon, and he does. He makes multiple political comments in the Sermon on the Mount. You can catch him if you're looking closely, especially in the Greek. But in any case, when Jesus is saying that is logos, the argument, the argument. Remember, this is a logos to tell us, right? And look what Matthew tells us. He's telling us this is a logos. So therefore, you should look for the tell us. In the first dialogue, the first argument, the first dialogue is the thesis of the argument. And the thesis is, why did Christ come and what's the purpose of the Messiah? Why did he come? To fulfill the law. What's the purpose of the Messiah? To fulfill the law. Second dialogue. Second dialogue starts in Matthew 10, 1 through 11, 1. He called the twelve disciples to him and gave him authority to drive out evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. And by the way, you know, do I have time? Yeah, I, I guess I'll take some time. Um, this is not what it says in the Greek. There is no healing being done in the Gospels at all. No healing. Why? Why is no healing being done? That's right. Every, if you remember, we skipped over the narrative part, but, you know, in one case, he's, he healed... Uh, Peter's mother-in-law's fever. Uh -huh. Well, it's not fever. In Greek, it's pure. Anybody know what pure is? Pure is the fire from Zeus. People believe that if you had a fever, it meant that you had antagonized Zeus. And therefore, <coughs> Zeus had given you fire in your body. But we translate that as a fever and that Jesus cured or healed. That's not what he did. Because he didn't heal every disease and sickness. They didn't know what disease was. People believe that deeds. How did the disease come upon you? From the gods. From the gods or fate, right? You either made, made the gods mad, pure, or it was fate. Because you were fated to be that way. Or there's another way. Sin. Sin. You did run. That's a Hebraic thought. That's a Hebraic thought. But you see, that's good, because that's what the Hebrews thought. Hebrews thought it came from God, Jehovah, your sickness, your illness. But they didn't understand it came from bacteria and whatever. So therefore, you were either filled with demons or you were fated by the gods. So therefore, would you heal people? They put them in a shlepions. People would put them in a shlepions. So if you were ill, you had a disease or you had a demon, right? You were demon-possessed. That meant you were demon-possessed. Or you were stricken by the gods. They would take you. They'd take their children. They'd put them in shlepa. If they didn't die, they came home. It meant they got better. The gods got happier. What's a shlepa? A shlepa is a temple to the god of Shlepias. Yeah. And it became the first hospitals because people wouldn't go there except to die. So you say to your kid, 